And um, so we are going to uh, introduce uh, Sue Linja and Cian Waite, who are co-authors of the Alzheimer's and Prevention Food Guide. And what, you want to just start by telling us a little bit about your background so that we can uh, begin to proceed with the talk. Absolutely. So this is Sue Linja, and I am a registered dietitian nutritionist. Um, if you were to see me, I'm, a, I'm not very tall, and I have brown hair. I'm kind of the Italian culinary um, person of the, of the two of us. Um, I've worked my entire career with nutrition and aging, um, a lot on the, the, the end spectrum um, with uh, assisted living facilities and skilled nursing facilities. And then more recently, really um, passionate about prevention and um, trying to, to help us all figure out how to live the la latter part of our lives um, with a higher quality of life and how we can do that through nutrition. So I have a, a lot of experience with um, Alzheimer's disease in the treatment end or, you know, the, the I guess, again, the not the preventative side. And so um, we have, you know, we've been working really hard to try to have more promise um, for ourselves and our, our families and, and all of the people that we work with. So we hope today to be able to share with you some of the research that we have done um, and have some, some positives for you, things that you can, can look towards to improve your overall health and your brain health. So I'll let Cian tell about herself. Well, I'm not going to say that I have blonde hair because they can see me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, you guys can see me too. Oh, <laughs> but you can't see how tall I am. <laughs> so I'm uh, Cian Safari Wade. I'm a professor here at the University of Idaho. And I have a background, uh, research background, and um, incredible interest in aging uh, because it, we will have the largest group of 80, 90 year olds. Uh, coming up here in the next few years that we've ever had. And so I'm very interested in how we age and how we do it well. Um, I'm the co-author of the um, Alzheimer's um, Prevention Food Guidebook with Sue, um, and so helped with doing the research on uh, food and Alzheimer's. And also I'm involved in um, some current research uh, where my team is looking at um, fermented foods and its impact on cognition, we're specifically looking at uh, yogurt and um, some of the probiotics in yogurt. So uh, I'm just excited to be here and to share what we know and about the research. And um, I have a mom with Alzheimer's, as does Sue, and you're going to be talking about your mom uh, shortly. My mom uh, is still alive, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty passionate about doing what we can do now to prevent it not only myself, but others as well. That's awesome. So let, let's talk about some of the research then, or you just get, just talk, go, go okay, through we're, it. We're just gonna talk. So I did wanna just say that we have, um, you know, we have a slide presentation for you today with lots of pretty colorful pictures. Um, and we have set it up in the past for it to be pretty sciencey, but we're gonna try to take it down a notch. Um, and then if you want to know more specific about the science, we have a lot of resources for you. But we wanted really to make it uh, more practical and to be able to, you know, bring it bring it down and, and, and be able to tell stories along the way too of things that are, are real life for for us and and along the way for our, our research. So um, we will get started and you know of course we have learning objectives which I'm just gonna fly right by um, and get into our our first slide. And so Cian's gonna Okay. going to start here. So. so these are the current, just a little bit of stats and background. Um, this is the current information from 2017 on the leading causes of death in the United States. And you can see heart disease, cancer, um, and diabetes, um, and in some cases, stroke. Those can all be fought with a knife and a fork. Those are our diets, are they not diets, they're, they're uh, diseases related to diet. And recently, Alzheimer's has climbed onto this list. Uh, it is now the fifth, um, or in this slide, sixth leading cause of death in the United States. And so um, it hasn't been talked about in this realm before of what we can do to prevent it with food. So just to give you an idea, 
um, it's now time to start talking and having those discussions. Um, this is the, uh, we will refer to some of the things that we have put in our book, The Alzheimer's Prevention Food Guide. Um, Dr. Uh, Rudy Tanzi is um, director of the Alzheimer's Genome Project. And he actually uh, put a nice comment on the back of our book and said, ne never has diet been so important for brain health and reducing the risk for Alzheimer's. Um, and so I think that's really important. Now is the time and um, we need to, to take action. Okay, so this is my mom. So um, this is Sarah and Sarah Spadia. So she's a lovely Italian lady and um, grew up on the East Coast outside of Boston. Um, her parents were came over through Ellis Island um, from Southern Italy. And Sarah was in her, her youth, uh, a spitfire, you know, a passionate lady, loved to learn, loved numbers. Um, this is her I think maybe before she is kissing Santa Claus. That's my German dad. And I, I unfortunately, I blame my German dad for, for some things, you know, that for lots of things, you know, we all have problems with our dads, right? <laughs> anyway, but my mom was, uh, grew up with a Mediterranean style diet in her family, you know, a more emphasis on, on fish, lots of plants, lots of legumes, um, you know, little red wine from the time she could, could drink out of a cup. Um, but it, when she married the, um, my dad, she met my dad, he was in the Navy, they moved west to my dad's family and out here to Idaho. And my mom had to go from the city, her city life to, you know, plucking chickens and, and doing all those kinds of things. And, and really started, I mean, you know, once the kids were born, she was the mother who was up, you know, before dawn and was asleep after midnight and probably only got an average of about five hours of sleep. She would, everything was surrounding around the children. My dad's influence um, with the German had our Mediterranean, you know, model at home turn a bit more into a, you know, bratwurst and, and sauerkraut model. Um, the sauerkraut part we'll talk about but later with fermentation. Um, but anyway, so my mom, you know, I think that our, our lifestyle and my mom's lifestyle changed some, somewhat. Um, at the end, with my mom passed away about six years ago um, from Alzheimer's disease. And, but I wanted just to tell you what a lovely person she was through that disease. Because I think a lot of times we just hear all of the terrible stories about you know, the, how the dementia takes effect with behavior and all of that. My mom was free. She was who I think she was when she was younger. You know, she, growing up, we had to wear our socks and shoes all the time, right? Because, you know, the hazards could happen if you didn't have your socks and shoes on. But in the end, mom was pulling off her socks and shoes. And um, if she got frustrated and couldn't remember a word, she'd like to say, you know, shit. And then she'd start laughing and we would all start laughing. And so, um, you know, I just want to, you know, it's a, a devastating, obviously, to not have the mom that you had before, but my mom was, was beautiful in her, her dementia and with her Alzheimer's. And so I guess I just, with that, you know, I just wanted to share a little bit more about my, my mom because it's the passion behind why I want to do more with research and finding out how we can, can help others. Here are, you know, the, the less positive things going on now, um, 5.7 million living with Alzheimer's in the U.S. Um, the, you know, the projections for the future are not great at all. It's a fifth leading cause of death in the elderly, um, you know, and we, we know what the costs of the disease are. Um, the posterior cortical atrophy obviously is even less, you know, researched and known about, and thanks to people like Jamie Tallon, you know, we're learning more. Um, and what we wanted to really preface with today is, although we, you know, there's, it's not specifically um, researched related to food and diet, we feel like we have a, you know, a, a real um, strong base for a, a healthy anti-inflammatory type diet that is going to reduce brain atrophy regardless, you know, so we want to really, um, 
you know, be positive about this. I think that there is, we're really are on the, the cutting edge of finding out a lot more about how we can influence, um, you know, all types of brain atrophy and, and dementia with diet. So our next slide is um, just looking at the, the modifiable risk factors, the things we actually have some control over. Um, you know, you, you probably have heard and seen and practiced these yourself. Um, regular exercise and active social life, which sometimes is, you know, those things can be difficult depending on where you're at with the, the stage of your disease. Um, quality sleep, stress management, and mental stimulation. And of course today, um, because we're not experts in really any of those others except maybe the exercise piece, um, we're going we're gonna to stick to our expertise and talk more about the healthy diet. Now I'll let Sian talk because I, I, I get carried away sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so this looks like a complicated slide, but uh, bear with me for a minute because I want to explain how the big picture of nutrition impacts Alzheimer's disease. There, it, it is complicated and there are so many different variables, but if you take a look at this slide, you'll see that we have, let's start at the top, you'll see that there are, and we're going to be talking about these, you'll see some trace minerals and how they can affect amyloid uh, deposition in the brain. Um, how they can affect, how trace minerals affect aging, how they have an influence on um, the degeneration of the neural fib fibros in the brain. Um, so they, they, and they overlap. And so um, if you look to the right of that, we've got plant flavonoids. When we talk about plant flavonoids, we're talking about um, things that are in plants that protect the plant from uh, pests uh, from disease, etc. They're, they're naturally occurring in plants. And in fruits and vegetables, they tend to gather around the skin in order to protect that, um, that plant from an invasion of something that will be destructive. So think about plant flavonoids as protection from your brain from things that will destroy, destroy it as well. Um, and plant flavonoids can affect uh, degeneration because they, many of them are act as antioxidants. They can have uh, effects on synaptic connections. They can increase the, uh, the efficacy of synapses. Um, we know that omega-3 fatty acids, we will spend, we'll spend time talking about that, specifically EPA and DHA, actually specifically DHA, uh, we'll, we'll mention that. And that's a high, uh, strong, uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, again, protecting the brain, protecting those cells. Uh, vitamins are very interactive with um, metabolism. Uh, metabolic substrates are the things like CoQ10, uh, things that have and an, are involved in the metabolic processes. And then um, metabolic substrates can also affect the vascular compromise. And then last but not least, we have the category of antioxidants. And so all of these things play a role in the disease, and we are going to hopefully help decipher some of these in, a, in as simple way as we possibly can today. Sorry about the spelling of infl inflammation. I just noticed that there. We've got a, a word spelled wrong. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll fix that. Slide. <laughs> yeah, okay, so um, we really like this picture here of to, to depict, and maybe you've seen it before, but um, the, the difference in uh, diet and, and the brain, we're, we're going to talk a bit more about four things with this slide. The first is um, the left-hand picture of our, our, hand, our cheeseburger here on a white bun, you know, it probably has all kinds of good sauce and salt and all that. And um, this is a depiction of the, the Western diet brain. And the Western diet is really to be simplified would be a, a diet that, you know, is very common here in the U.S., um, high in meat. It also could be called the meat sweet diet. So high in meat, high in sugar, higher in processed foods and fatty, you know, saturated fat types of foods and in salt. And so there, there's definitely been um, a lot of research behind the effects of the, the Western diet and on um, you know, inflammatory processes and diseases such as, you know, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancers. Um, so that would, you know, lead us to the, the next thing, which is inflammation. 
and that, you know, again, the, uh, a lot of focus on the Mediterranean diet and the reduction of, of inflammation and the reduction of atrophy in the brain. And, and some of the latest research, like there was a one study in um, neurology in April of this last year that looked at the brains of 30 to 60 year olds um, it, and they did brain imaging um, two years, you know, at, at, at baseline and then again at two years. And the con control, they had two, you know, groups, obviously. One was um, those that typically followed a Western diet and the other was those that followed a, you know, Mediterranean type diet. And at the onset, there was a significant um, lesser amount of brain activity in and you know more atrophy in those on the Western diet than the Mediterranean diet. So then, two years forward, you know they followed their same diet patterns, and again further significance in those two areas. And those were were people that had not had any symptoms yet of um, MCI or you know or the the memory concerns at that point. So um, very, very strong evidence to show that, that there can be an impact. And I, I believe in that study, they said three and a half to five year delay in you know, the, the onset of um, symptoms it, for those following the Mediterranean type diet. So how that relates to inflammation is basically the current hypothesis is that, um, that inflammatory activity in the brain promotes um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease by increasing the production of amyloid um, amyloids and killing the healthy neurons in the brain and um, ultimately reducing the cells that are helpful to decrease that amyloid. So that's the what they feel the inflammation um, factor is and that an inflammation really we know is the, the root of all all evils with all chronic diseases including heart disease, you know stroke. Um, diabetes and and you know and, and it is increased in obesity. Mm. So I'm going to say let's just talk about the gut brain relationship. We'll be talking a little bit more about it, but I want to give you an idea. The gut brain relationship that what we consume and digest has a direct effect on the brain, whether or not it be sugar or fat, um, anything that we eat, the brain and the gut are totally interconnected. And so we will be talking about that, but, but just be aware um, that, that they communicate. The brain is what tells you you're full. Uh, the brain is what tells you that you're hungry. Um, so there's this direct connection that really has a lot to do with Alzheimer's disease. And then we, we also know that healthy fats and healthy plants um, will have huge impacts on the health of the brain. And when Sue's referring to the Mediterranean diet, He's referring to a diet that's full of fresh fish, um, that's full of fresh vegetables, uh, fresh fruit, um, some poultry, eggs, um, a, a low amount of red meat, uh, moderate amounts of wine, uh, a fat amount, fat level that's around 25 to 35% of the diet. So it's relatively a, a low fat diet. And of that fat, we're talking about olive oil and a very small amount of saturated fat around 8%. We can see in the next slide, uh, Sue, you'll talk about this, but this is a, an example of, of the Mediterranean diet that we have in our book. Yeah, so we, we just extracted this um, uh, graphic here out of our, our book, and we had a, basically a two-week um, food guide, and we, we reviewed 105 different foods for their mind-nourishing attributes. And so each food, it was 11 different categories of foods and, and each food we were able to identify, you know, based on, on research with anti-inflammatory antioxidant and help nourish our brain. So from that, we put together a brain-friendly um, plate so that you can see what that would look like. Um, over on the right-hand side was, was my kitchen counter. And um, we, we tried to put a piece of fruit in here so that you could see the fruit you know, or fruited yogurt or something on the side there. But um, anyway, so that really the plate is built around half of it being um, greens and other vegetables. If you could see in that quinoa, it's going to have some, some greens that were sauteed in there. Um, whole grains and legumes take up a quarter of the plate and then nuts, seeds, eggs, fish, or tofu as the other. So we really didn't 
we really focused on very plant-based um, diet with, uh, you know, not including um, red meats or, or much, much meat, but getting our protein sources from more plant-based protein. Um, spices and herbs are an area we reviewed, fermented foods, um, healthy oils, and then, then fruits. And then additionally, coffee, tea, and, and seaweed were included in our, our book, and we'll talk more about that. And that's that. how we've kind of divided the presentation today, each one of those pieces. So. Okay, we also did a comparison of the, the MIND diet, which is a DASH and Mediterranean diet, um, the Mediterranean diet, and the ketogenic diet. So I won't get into those so much, but if you have any questions about those particular diets that are, are out there on the market, we'd be glad to talk more about those with your questions. Can, can, you, can you just give us a, a, a five, five seconds on each one of those so that we... Sure. Let, me, let me back up. So the MIND diet is a, a Mediterranean diet in, in conjunction with the DASH diet, which is the DASH diet was set up to prevent and reduce hypertension. Um, and so those, that diet is focused on very plant-based again. It has food groupings that are, are disallowed in it, you know, including a, a lot more of the um, Western, Western type foods. And then there's a focus on berries, you know, from the fruit category, Inclu it includes a, you know, a glass of wine a day, um, and otherwise very much focused on fish and a little bit of poultry, um, some um, dairy, yogurts, um, fermented kinds of foods. And, and so that particular, that, out of that was out of Rush University um, back east, and they showed really staggering results of like a 53% risk reduction for Alzheimer's disease development with that, that MIND diet. So it was a very, you know, really positive. Um, the Mediterranean diet is, you know, Sian described that already, um, but that was kind of the base of development of the MIND diet. There's also a Canadian brain diet that is very similar to, um, to the MIND and Mediterranean diet. Um, the ketogenic diet is a diet that has been used for years and years um, for since the 1950s for a reduction of epilepsy. And what they found is basically if you can put somebody into a state of ketosis, which is really removing all carbohydrates from the diet or very, very limited carbohydrates, then um, the brain uses a different pathway. So they bur it burns fat or ketones instead of carbohydrate. And carbohydrates, the main would be the main, glucose would be the main source of energy for the brain normally. So this would be taking glucose out of that pathway using fat um, as the source of energy. And by doing that, it easily crosses the blood brain barrier. And there, they have shown that there can be some, you know, definitely, re, definitely ep epilepsy control. And then more recently, the research has been surrounding, um, you know, reduced, uh, signs and symptoms of cognitive loss. And this has been utilized uh, and, and is being studied for people that are already um, have mild cognitive impairment and, and Alzheimer's disease. The problem is, if I can say this just as clear as, uh, you know, upfront as possible, it's very hard to sustain because it's really hard to not eat carbohydrates, to just have, you know, and it, you know, you can have leafy greens and you can have a, you know, a, the, the protein items, but um, you know, even a handful of berries a day is about as max as you can have before you've over, you know, stepped your carbohydrate limitation. So we've just found that it's not real reasonable for people to, to follow long-term. Is that helpful, Jamie? Okay. Okay, we're now going to go into the 11 different food groupings and we're going to talk about there's so much research. We're just going to pull out one or two research areas to, you know, make this a really research-based presentation. I'm going to talk about the research, and you're going to talk about uh, the practicality of how to get this into the diet. So we're going to start out by talking about herbs and spices. And I'm always so excited to talk about this specific um, spice. Um, I'm thinking many of you probably use turmeric um, in your diets. You can get it in the dried form or you can get it in a, in a the fresh form in the produce section. Uh, it's from the ginger family. It's a root, looks like a root. 
and you can, we will talk about how to use it, but it's been looked at in Asian, Middle Eastern, and Indian uh, cultures, and they've been using it for years and years to treat uh, inflammatory disorders. But what's interesting is those cultures do not have the incidence of Alzheimer's disease that, that we have in the United States and more European countries. So it's been looked at in the research pretty heavily recently. And um, if you look at turmeric, there's an active ingredient in it called curcumin. And in the research, it's been in the laboratory setting, it's actually reduced the amyloid plaque formation in laboratory mouse models. There haven't been a lot of human trials. There are many underway. However, just uh, last, uh, last month or maybe um, a couple of, let's see, 2017, yeah, 2017, um, there's a recent study published uh, by Gary Small out of UCLA in his lab, and they looked at, um, they gave their patients 90 milligrams. He gave patients, it was a placebo controlled double blind study, and it's published in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychology. But um, he gave patients, um, I think there were, it's a small study, I think there were 18 in each group. Um, so he gave them 90 milligrams of a highly bioavailable um, pill of curcumin twice a day. And he then measured amyloid and tau in the brains using the, uh, PET scans. And he found improvement in memory and attention by 28% after 18 months. And um, also reduction in tau and amyloid um, in the amygdala and the hypothalamus. So what does this mean for us? It, 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 it's interesting and there are more studies going on out there, but it's I interesting to think of how curcumin might act as an inflammation, anti-inflammation ingredient in the foods that we use. And it's relatively harmless. Um, it's also very important to stimulate the DHA and ALA in the omega-3 fatty acids. Again, DHA is very important in Alzheimer's disease. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk about omega-3s. So Sian said it's harmless, and I will just put a little caveat on that, that it stains your fingers <laughs> for weeks. <laughs> so if you've ever used, used curcumin, you know, raw especially, you might want to put on a pair of gloves before you grate it or whatever, because it's in the root. I, I think I have permanent yellow under my, if you guys can see my fingertips, <laughs> my finger, fingertips. So um, the herbs and spices that we looked at in our book, Beyond um, turmeric were, you know, some of them included basil, cilantro, cinnamon, cumin, lavender, mint, and rosemary. Um, they all have that antioxidant protective uh, effect to them and have the, the like Sian was telling you about before, those, the types of protection that our fruits and vegetables have um, that can also help protect our, our cells and our brain. Fresh is best. Um, you usually use three times the amount of fresh than you would dried. So if you're doing a, a recipe that has, you know, the, the um, herb in it, you'd use three times the amount. You can chop and zest and sprinkle. We like to promote trying to use one herb or spice at each meal. Um, as far as turmeric goes, they, the studies have really shown that mixed with black pepper, it increases the availability and the absorption of the, the curcumin, you know, component in there. And so um, we have, both Sian and I, and we've, we've taught this, we have a, a pepper shaker or a salt and pepper shaker, but one of them is, is filled with um, turmeric with black pepper in it. And so you use that right at your stovetop or on your table. You can shake it on top of your your you know, eggs, you can put it in your soups and stews. Um, it, it has a pretty much earthy um, flavor to it. So it doesn't really alter the flavor too much. Um, you're used to seeing it in curries and, you know, some of the real strong flavors of curries come from some of the other spices in there. Um, great in salads and teas. I did a honey bomb um, gift this year and sorry, Jamie and Sian, I don't think either of you got my honey bomb, but we took local honey and, and mixed in fresh grated um, turmeric and citrus peel mm -hmm. and black pepper in that. And then, um, then with that, then you put it in your tea or you put it on your toast or whatever. So anyway, just some ideas for herbs and spices there for you. Can I just add to that? Sure. I actually make a um, 
actually cool with um, coconut oil, which is you know solid coconut oil and turmeric and a little cinnamon and kind of spicy and honey and we put it on toast and um, pancakes and, oatmeal, and things maybe? in oatmeal. It's wonderful and I love um, almond butter. That so there's a lot of different uses for, for turmeric. Very little taste. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is leafy greens. And uh, what does the research say about leafy greens? I think if there was one plant that we would be promoting for brain health the most, it would be leafy greens. Uh, we should have them every single day. And we're going to focus on kale here for a minute because we've all heard that you know kale is the holy grail of vegetables. I think um, it's wonderful. It's packed uh, with vitamin E, vitamin A, vitamin C, everything. But in the research, we're particularly interested in leafy greens because of their contribution of vitamin E to the diet, which has been linked in the a laboratory, again, with mice, uh, to promoting changes in the Alzheimer's-prone uh, um, symptoms in these mice. And um, the recommendation is 2,000 international units per day for patients with moderate, uh, moderate to mild AD. And in some studies, they've been able to show a functional decline with, with a slower functional decline with those who supplemented. The other thing that leafy greens provide is selenium. And um, in animal studies, there's just profound effects uh, on the brain. Um, and the other thing, it's important to know that vitamin E works in conjunction with vitamin C as a recharger to antioxidants. And so again, leafy greens have it all. They have selenium, vitamin E, and vitamin C. And you can see the references down at the bottom of the studies that we captured that from. Okay, so besides packed with those things that Sian talked about, they're also high in fiber. I think if you are, you know, if you if you go on a, a kick where you're eating these every single day, that would be what we would recommend. Um, two cups of raw or a cup of cooked helps your bowels move and it helps your, you know, your brain work better. So we, we're very strongly advocating leafy greens daily. Um, we reviewed several different ones in our book, some of which were arugula, um, which I love. That's my favorite. Um, beet greens, chard, kale, spinach, and watercress um, is not really a, a super common green here in the West anyway, but watercress rated higher than as far as a nutrient per ounce or whatever than any other green out there. So you might want to look at, at watercress too if you haven't tried that before. Um, of course that the greens are really, besides eating them in a raw salad, I mean I had a oh a roasted kale salad the other day that took me like an hour to eat. It was <laughs> so hard to eat. It, you know, so sometimes they it's easier if you can put them in soups and smoothies and things where um, you can get a more concentrated um, amount in a you know lesser lesser volume and they're easier to Chew. They take a little less time that way, um, but you, I guess you burn less calories because it's yeah. it's good to chew. Um, the other thing I would say is I slip leafy greens underneath anything that I do. So if you're if you have a soup or a stew or a casserole, I start out by putting a handful of leafy greens at the bottom of my bowl, and then I scoop in my soup or stew. It's a wonderful way to get greens in without you know a whole lot of effort, and they're good in in everything. I mean, the arugula is a little, if you don't like pepper, it's a little spicy flavored, but most of the rest of them are mild enough flavored that you can really use them that way very easily. We're going to talk about vegetables. Uh, and what, what does the research say? And we're going to um, do this pretty quickly because it's kind of a repeat of leafy greens. Um, but I think here's the message here. We recommend sweet potatoes because, and, and it's not that we have anything against potatoes, um, we love potatoes, we love sweet potatoes. Uh, both have been uh, are, are important foods in the literature, but sweet potatoes have not only vitamin C, but they also have vitamin A, which have both been found to be strong antioxidants. So if you're a potato lover, uh, you might wanna try switching over to a baked sweet potato or sweet potato fries, et cetera, just because it has that added uh, vitamin A content in it. Um, uh, definitely high fruit and vegetable consumption is associated with um, AD risk factors. Uh, cruciferous vegetables are um, also can impact the rate of uh, cognitive decline. And when we talk about cruciferous vegetables, they're the stinky vegetables. They're the, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the um, Brussels, sprouts. Brussels sprouts, those types of things. Um, but again, a great vegetable to add to the diet 
uh, for vitamin C and vitamin A. That's all I want to talk about. Awesome. So here are your vegetable tips. Um, they're low in sodium, low in calories and fat, high in antioxidants, um, lots of brain boosting uh, vitamins and minerals. We want you to leave the skin on if at all possible. And the reason is, Sian already talked about where those phytochemicals are, where are those protecting antioxidants are on the skin. So besides that, you, you, know, you get more fiber in the skin. So try to do that um, whenever possible. I just wash, up, wash them up and leave the skins on when I'm cutting vegetables to either eat raw or, or put into my dishes. Um, we want you to have four or more servings daily. Different colors are great. Um, we, I mean, fruits are wonderful too, but we believe vegetables are like the par paramount of the fruit and vegetable category. So we've changed our term to say vegetables and fruits instead of fruits and vegetables. Um, we reviewed Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage, tomatoes, and sweet potatoes, in addition to some other vegetables in our book. And I just want to say that I, I have, I try really hard to put vegetables in breakfast every day. And I know that's a little different take, but it's to do a, you know, an egg bake, even with a, you know, if you want to use an egg beater or whatever, and some sweet potato and, and lots of different um, leafy greens and vegetables in, in breakfast. Um, that's, a, you know, one way to try to get your four servings a day is to start out eating them at breakfast. All right, we want to talk about fruit and in, specifically we want to talk about um, the research related to berries and grapes. Um, which is in the next slide. Um, but I want to say a couple things about vitamin C. Berries and grapes, berries in particular, are packed full of vitamin C. And vitamin C is a, may neutralize uh, oxygen and nitrogen-based radicals, and those are what break down cells. Um, and so uh, it's very important, again, to get vitamin C from fruit, if at all possible. And what's interesting is that the plasma levels of vitamin C in at least seven different studies have shown an inverse relationship with vitamin C and Alzheimer's disease and cognitive impairment, meaning the higher the vitamin C level in the blood, the, the lower the characteristics of Alzheimer's disease and the lower the cognitive decline. So we know that there's a relationship there. And again, berries are high, high, high in vitamin C. The other thing that I want to talk about is resveratrol, and resveratrol is a polyphenol, which, remember back to that slide, that, that graphic slide with all the uh, circles, that we talked about flavonoids and, and polyphenols, and um, resveratrol is found in the skins of grapes, raspberries, and mulberries, and resveratrol is an incredibly powerful antioxidant. It's also found in wine. Um, and so it's, I mean, if, if at all possible, eat grapes, but having a glass of wine once a day is, may not necessarily be a bad thing at all uh, because of these anti-inflammatory uh, properties. And it gets back to that French paradox where they drink wine all the time, um, but have lower incidence of heart disease, and it may have something to do with resveratrol. Watch in the news for resveratrol. It's being studied very heavily at NIH right now. Um, and they're looking at the effects of resveratrol in decreased amyloid plaque uh, deposition in animals. Um, they've got some um, human studies going on right now uh, looking at resveratrol uh, in, in humans uh, because it, it appears to restore the integrity of the blood-brain barrier, which would, if, it, if the integrity of the blood-brain blood barrier is restored, that means more energy and nutrients can cross over and get into the brain to heal any problems that are any uh, decline or um, damage that's being done. Okay, so here are my fruit tips. Um, again, we, you're, gonna, you're gonna think we're crazy about the skin of things, but <laughs> keep the skin and peel on. Um, we want you to try to have three servings a day from the fruit group, um, different colors, again, of, of fruit. So if all you like is, is apples, we want you to try to reach out and, and try some different types of fruits. Um, we reviewed berries, melons, citrus, and plums as some of those fruits. Um, you know, one thing I, I think if, if you're not someone who likes to eat a lot of fruit, sometimes you can um, cook the fruit down. You can eat the fruit in a dried form and add it to your hot cereal in the morning. Um, I like to mix fruit into grain dishes, and I think that that's a little bit different approach. Um, 
you know, we think about putting fruit into salads. So maybe you put pears and, you know, um, pomegranates or something in a salad, but I also like to mix them into whole grain. So if you're doing a, a quinoa salad or a, you know, farro salad or something like that, it's really yummy with um, both nuts and fruits in it. So another way to try to get more fruit in. Okay, legumes. What does your research say about legumes? Uh, we pulled from our hat garbanzo beans because there's plenty of research out about garbanzo beans and they were studied pretty heavily uh, in the Rush University study about with the mind diet. We're also from Idaho, which is the garbanzo bean capital of the world, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, so we know that the outer coat of the garbanzo bonzo beans has concentrated flavonoids. Again, where it's concentrated, them. we're not going to name them. Um, and then the interior as well is a concentrated source. So garbanzo beans get an A plus in the ratings for what they offer to, for brain rich nutrients. Um, also, they are rich in vitamin B vitamins. And we know that vitamin B or the B vitamins are linked to improved homocysteine levels. We're not going to talk a lot about homocysteine levels, but having your physician measure your homocysteine levels periodically is a good indicator um, sometimes of what your vitamin B status is. And we're particularly interested in B12, uh, B6, and, um, and folic acid. Okay, so tips for legumes. Um, maybe I think a bean, a bean for breakfast. Tip. I'm, I'm going to load up your breakfast, I think, today with <laughs> beans and vegetables. But so um, legumes are economical. They're obviously plant-based, um, loaded with, with fiber, B vitamins, anti-inflammatory properties. Um, we promote a half cup cooked daily or at least three to four times a week. And we uh, reviewed a wide variety of, of legumes in our, our book, including garbanzo beans. Um, you can blend up any of the beans when they're cooked. And, and a lot of people will ask, can I, do I have to cook them from dry or can I use canned? And, you know, the canned beans have more sodium in them. So usually we just recommend rinsing them to try to get more of the salt off. But beans from a can are, you know, very convenient. And if you're not patient enough to soak the beans and cook them from dry, then totally having, having more versus less and having them from the can is fine. Whole grains, I, let's just go to that slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about whole grains. Whole grains are related to B vitamins, and we've already mentioned B vitamins. They are so important to the neuro, neuron health, and studies show that, um, that, that they've been helpful in slowing the progression of Alzheimer's disease in the gray matter. Um, we also know, again, as I mentioned, deficiencies are associated with, low, with increased homocysteine levels. And so whole grains are, you know, delicious, full of fiber, you know, really wonderful part of our day. And I know that there's been um, some studies around not having whole grains in the diet, especially for, for mind health. We didn't find the research to back that. And from a dietitian standpoint, we want to be sure we're not missing out on, on a lot of the healthy nutrients, which you would may only find in whole grains. Um, we recommend three one-half cup servings or one ounce servings daily. We reviewed barley and bulgur and oats and millet and you know so a variety of different ones. And you can cook whole grains um, and, and keep them for a week. So sometimes some of these grains are take longer to cook. Like I'm thinking I made barley, a barley dish not that long ago, and the barley was a long cooked barley. So I just make more of it when I'm making it and it actually freezes well or you can store it for up to seven days in your refrigerator. So you could make a bigger amount and use it, you know, on, from breakfast, lunch, and dinner on the top of the soups and stews and in salads and such. Uh, a couple things about nuts and seeds. Um, we chose um, walnuts. Uh, walnuts are, again, probably one of the well, have the highest omega-3 fatty acids in them. We get omega-3 fatty acids from primarily two sources. One is walnuts and the other is um, salmon. Um, we're going to talk about salmon soon, but, um, and, well, fatty fish. Salmon, mm -hmm. is, what's the other? Uh, there's a whole mackerel. Bunch of there's a whole <laughs> bunch of other ones, but salmon's the one we probably eat most commonly. Um, so omega-3 fatty acids are a handful of walnuts every day. 
um, will get you the omega-3s that you need. Omega-3s have been studied um, widely, um, need to be studied study widely with cognitive function. Um, we are specifically interested in DHA. There are three different types of omega-3s, the three, but we're particularly um, interested in EPA and DHA, DHA having the most research to, to back up the benefits of the brain, in the brain. Okay, so um, at least one serving a day of nuts and seeds, um, like Sienna said, a handful of nuts or, or equivalent to a quarter cup or two tablespoons of seeds. Um, we looked at flaxseed, chia seed, pistachio, walnuts, and almonds as some of the, the nuts and seeds reviewed in our book. And I like to say, let's blend our own nut butter. And you can, you can put a combination in if you want to do a, you know, a flax and almond or a walnut pistachio butter. I mean, so you just need a good uh, blade on your food processor or a blender to be able to do that. But it's been really fun to create um, my own nut butter that you can use in a variety of ways at home. We're gonna talk about uh, oil and fats for a minute and, and talk about what the research says. And of course, in the uh, Mediterranean diet, it's all about olive oil. Um, we know that olive oil, olive oil has been widely studied in uh, reduction of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we recommend at least one serving um, a day, two tablespoons. Um, but let's talk for a minute about coconut oil because I think of all the questions we get, we get the most about coconut oil. Um, and there's a lot of hype out there about coconut oil. So it's studies looking at coconut oil are really, really hot right now. Um, and it's important for you to know without getting into all of the science and all the details that there's a, a difference between um, two kinds of oil. Coconut oil has been looked at because it replicates something that we call uh, medium chain triglyceride or MCT oil. In the hospital, we use MCT oil all the time in uh, formulas that we give to patients, uh, but it's very, very expensive. So coconut oil is similar in nature to MCT oil. However, it has 12 carbons and MCT has eight to, to 10. And why does that matter? Uh, because in the literature and in the research, there's more promise of using MCT oil to um, alter the brain energy pathway. Um, and so that's where the emerging research is, is looking at MCT oil. And also the, remember when um, Sue was talking about the ketogenic diet and that blood brain barrier? In Alzheimer's, in Alzheimer's disease, we often see the brain having a some sort of an insulin resistance. And when you have insulin resistance, that means glucose, which is the energy source of choice for the brain, can't get in the brain. So there's been many studies currently going on, not a lot of conclusions yet, but they're looking at MCT oil as a possible energy source to use to get across that barrier and that the brain can utilize that in a better way than it can glucose, especially for those brains that have um, um, insulin um, resistance. So we don't know a lot about coconut oil. Do we recommend it to people? Um, I, I think the jury's sort of out on that, but stay tuned and watch what comes out in the, in the scientific research because I think you'll see more, uh, we need to see more studies with actual coconut oil. It's a lot cheaper than MCT. Okay. Um, next. Did you have anything you want to say about oil? No, no, about picking it. Okay, uh, now we're going to talk about protein, um, and we're specifically going to talk about salmon, fatty fish. Um, fatty fish is an excellent source of omega, of omega three fatty acids, and um, we are interested in DHA, uh, dicosa hexionic acid, uh, and it's um, we, it's been studied a lot in terms of heart disease, but it has recently um, shown promise in reducing Alzheimer's disease risk factors. Um, we've seen deficits in both EPA and DHA levels found in a, a variety of different neurodegenerative disorders. So it's, um, it's important to, to think about omega-3 fatty acids. If you are not a fish lover, um, hopefully you, you consume walnuts and other nuts. Um, there's been, again, the traditional um, placebo-controlled studies, double-blind, that have um, been shown 
quite significant work improving uh, short-term and working immediate verbal memory, uh, delayed recall uh, capacity. All of those areas um, have, have shown improvement in, EP, in DHA. Incidentally, we, um, get, we got a lot of DHA when we were young from breast milk because it's, it's high in DHA. Uh, that's the other area besides fatty fish. Um, so it, the other protein foods that we looked at in our, our book and in our reviews were, besides fatty fish, were eggs and tofu. Um, we recommend one serving per day or three or four times per week for, for fish. Um, and anchovies, eel, lake trout, um, sardines, mackerel, salmon um, were some of the ones that we reviewed. We also looked at eggs with um, choline, the, the nutrient choline in them, and we know that there's a connection with choline and acetylcholine with um, brain health. And so I think that eggs have gotten, versus their previous bad rap um, for brain health, have really been something that you know, is, is looked to be more, more positive. Um, we do want to encourage you to get enough protein in your breakfast meal because our bodies can only utilize a certain amount of protein in the day. And as we age, we lose protein mass. It's called sarcopenia and it sounds really bad. And it is because as I went through menopause, I saw my arms start to droop and I knew sarcopenia was setting in. So one of the things you can do besides that resistance activity to keep your muscles strong is to make sure you're getting 25 to 30 grams of protein in your breakfast meal. And I know, a, you know grams doesn't probably mean mean you know much to to many of you but it would be a yeah if you think about the the palm of your hand you know a size of whether it be you know it could be you know egg or yogurt or you know a tofu scramble whatever um there would that would be a, a good amount to try to get you to that that level um as far as the protein foods that we reviewed the, the one thought i had is you know we're, we're talking about herbs and spices too and how to increase those to make a fresh herb pesto is absolutely delicious on any one of the foods that we talk, the proteins that we talked about. So that might be a way to get your, your uh, herbs and spices in alongside your protein. And I, I know we're short on time on fermented foods. Fermented foods have, um, have um, we know, I've already mentioned about the brain and the uh, gut connection. But an altered micropopulation has actually been in, observed in people with Alzheimer's disease. And so we think that that, that physical and chemical link between the gut and the brain is very important. There was a research study recently done in 2016 that uh, looked at uh, cognitive, um, that measured cognition, uh, and they added probiotics, they added probiotics to milk. And those with probiotics, added to their milk versus non had, he had incredible results. It wasn't a large study, uh, but um, so, uh, so profound that it's caused many to pick up this research topic. So I think in the next two years, we're going to see more about this. This is the topic of one of my research studies. We are looking at yogurt. If you look in the literature, there's actually four different strains of probiotics that have been linked um, to uh, brain health. Um, Bifidus bacterium lactis, uh, acidophilus, L. acidophilus, L. Uh, ramsnosis, and L. casei. And all four of those, uh, we found a yogurt that actually had all four of them Nancy's yogurt, um, Nancy's, what is it called? Um, yeah. Nancy's grass fed yogurt has all four of them. So we're actually going to be doing a three month study um, to see if that has any effect on uh, cognition with our um, subjects. So I'm really interested in that area. Okay, and I, um, I am interested in this too, because the German side of me makes sauerkraut every year. So we, you know, that's one um, fermented food. Red wine, thank goodness, because we both like that, shows up on the list. Uh, we also looked at miso, apple cider vinegar, craft beer, um, and yogurt and kefir. Our recommendation is one serving a day of something that's fermented. And, and those people that we studied that lived into their hundreds, everyone had fermented foods in their life. So we know that it also is a, you know, a proponent of longevity. Um, a half cup to one cup serving or one tablespoon in the, in the apple cider vinegar. 
Um, brew your own. I mean, I, I think that there's been, there's a real push across the country for making kombucha, um, brewing your own craft beers, you know, possibly, you know, wine and other kinds of drinks. And then in my household, um, sauerkraut and kimchi and, and vegetable based fermented. And I see items. that you made one uh, of those batches of um, sauerkraut. I bet you put turmeric in there. Oh, yeah, you see the yellow. Yeah. That was a, so I tried not just regular sauerkraut. I did a horseradish root one. I did, you'll see on the far right, that's a mustard seed one. Um, and then my turmeric had black pepper in it, of oh. course. So <laughs> anyway, yeah. it was, uh, it's fun, fun to play with that. So, um, the, probably the last area I just wanted to mention that we we also looked at coffee, tea, and seaweed as three of the the items that we reviewed in our book. We recommend at least one serving per day of one of these items. And I know seaweed doesn't really seem like it belongs here, but we didn't know where else to put it. Um, very healthy as far as lots of um, antioxidants and and um, anti-inflammatory agents in all three of these things. Um, one idea would be maybe, you know, to do put green tea or, or a espresso kind of shot in a smoothie too, if you don't like to, to drink it. Um, and it, it really, the green tea, um, you know, has probably been studied more so with, uh, associated with prevention of mild cognitive decline in at least one study that we quote here. Yeah, we are, we are running out of time. Sleep, exercise, mind activities, and stress reduction. We won't talk about those. You all probably are aware of the, the benefits of that. Um, HIIT exercise, which is the high intensity exercise, um, has really been shown to help with mitochondrial um, health. And so that would be in the brain. So that would be something we would recommend if you were so inclined. So we put this handout in here. Some of you might be interested in using this handout uh, when you're working with your physician. We didn't, nothing existed for us to work with patients. So um, this handout talks about uh, the various different foods, the amounts that you need, serving sizes per day. And then it's just sort of a self-assessment for you to check your see if you're getting these. And then also on the second, the diagnostic test. And again, this is something to use with your physician to see if you've had some of these diagnostic tests done um, that are related to the brain health. Um, do you want to say anything about this? No, just, just, I'm sorry. I'm not going to leave this. We'll get, I'll call Markel as soon as I'm done. Great. <laughs> This is important for me to taking care of you. Thank okay. you, and we, we believe that too. So thank you very much for sticking with us. We are, um, we are feel like we're out of time for at least this part of the presentation and wanna allow you to ask questions. Yes. Um, so we have a picture of our book here and our, our um, website, and then we're open it up for Jamie to ask us questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you. That was terrific. You want to take the slides off so we can all see everybody and that yeah. would be terrific. Um, yeah, so I can see everybody. If anybody has a question, I will unmute you. So just raise your hand. Uh, Dave, uh, you're up. Okay. Question. If you had a choice between blueberries and raspberries, what would it be? Blueberries that seem to easier to store and are cheaper, but I don't know if we're losing something by eating blueberries versus raspberries. Wow, well, that's a great question. I think whichever one you're more willing to eat more of, because they both have very good redeeming um, qualities. I personally like raspberries more, so I tend to, you know, I might be a little raspberry biased, but um, I'll let Cian say what she thinks. And I, I mean, I, I agree. I think just as long as you eat them. Blueberries, raspberries, just eat them. And and blueberries have some other kind of side effects, that good things for men's health too. So yeah. I think I eat them. Just eat them. <laughs> good. Thank you, Dave. Anybody else questions? Raise your hand. I don't see. Oh yes, uh, Norm. Uh, what what about uh, medium pain triglycerides in uh, medical food axona? Say it again. Axona. And Axona. Yeah, we, you know, Axona is new to the United States. Um, it is a medical food. We have not had a lot of experience with it, but it has shown promise in Europe and Australia. And I, Axona, yeah, yeah. No, this Sorry. too, okay. this one too, Axona. What, what is it? 
Axona, it has medium chain triglycerides in it. And it is, it, is it pretty, have you guys used it? Is it pretty spendy? Uh, yes, but we're fortunate that our insurance has approved that the, you know, it's medical food, but, it, but yeah. it's expensive, you're right. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing is they have shown that it causes some um, negative side effects in some people, including GI issues with GI. Yeah, diarrhea and, and such. And so, um, you know, it's certainly one of those things that we have to weigh the, the pros and cons of. And if you're, if you're able to tolerate that, um, then I think that it, it certainly doesn't show a lot of other risk. Um, and the fact that you have insurance that will cover it is huge because that is that stuff is expensive. MCT that's the problem with MCT oil is it's cost prohibitive. It's really spendy. But if you can tolerate it, and um, I I think it's great. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, yes. I can ask more questions. <laughs> what about avocado oil? Ah, that's great. Yeah. great stuff. So, you know, it's not something that I personally use just because I'm the Italian in me can't let me away from my olive oil, my extra virgin olive oil. But um, CN may have a little bit more. I, I don't have anything more it. to say, but I want you, this is like the big takeaway from today is to remember the fruit, the peel, and where your flavonoids are going to be concentrated. They're right under the peel. So eating the avocado is fabulous. Avocados are fabulous in salads. Um, anytime you can eat them, I'm not just not sure how much of those flavonoids are lost in the processing into that oil. That would be my only question. I don't know. Okay, I mean. good. I think Dave, Dave, thank you so much, Norm. Um, Dave, go ahead. I have one other qu quick question. I, under fruits, you didn't mention bananas. Is, what's your thoughts on bananas? Because we eat one a day. <laughs> Well, you know, bananas are totally fine. So I guess one thing we should have said is just because we didn't review bananas or a, or a certain food in our book doesn't mean that it's, you know, they don't have some redeeming quality. We just tried to choose from fruits those that had more, you know, research behind it, more evidence behind um, the, the nutrient composition of them that can actually help with nourishing your mind. So I don't think there's a problem with bananas. I mean, I have them around my kitchen and, and eat them also. Um, I just, it's just not one of the foods we chose to review. Okay. About bananas, I'm a big smoothie person because I can get my spinach or greens into that smoothie. I would not ever have a smoothie that didn't have a banana in it. <laughs> a banana is what causes this, it makes it sweet and delicious. And Jamie, I know you were just having a banana in your smoothie. Um, don't you agree? You've got to have either bananas or apples in your smoothie to give it that, that yummy taste. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Barbara, Carmela, anybody, Steve? Nothing? You know, so Jamie, we, would, we wouldn't mind a little bit of feedback just on whether this was um, too yeah. sciencey, to, you know, was there, is there areas that the, you know, er, everybody on would like to see more of or less of? Any, any, what, anybody want to comment on the uh, tenor of the talk in terms of, of what you expected, what you learned, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, th I found it very balanced. I found it very easy to, to understand. I think sometimes people like kind of gloss over, you know, like and say it's too technical. I didn't find that at all. So you know, bravo to you guys. And I'm going to uh, start eating more kale. I just bought my seeds for my garden and I, I didn't put kale in because I didn't use any of my kale last year and it was an abundance. Kathleen, did you have anything you wanted us to, to, to add to this discussion? I thought it was very beneficial for me. I really enjoyed it. And it's more for myself going forward to protect my brain cells. Um, my husband, uh, I keep it on, I keep the diet. Uh, it's very similar to a diet that I serve and have served for a long time. Um, I really enjoyed the slides. I enjoyed all the information. 
Um, may I interject a question though about totally. Washington State and any total and any local groups? For I'm new to all of this. My husband's just been diagnosed with uh, PCA, and uh, I'm just trying to gather as much information as possible. Yes, we we actually have a map uh, where we've been putting up people who want to be on the map. So that means that this is okay. a self-selection group, but we have four people in Washington state. So what I can do is um, if you'd like, um, just see me through my PCA support group site okay. or, come, or come on tomorrow and, and I will you know, uh, give, tell you who's, who's there in Washington state. Thank you. I couldn't get into the map, and I know I, I probably need further research on it, yeah. but I was so happy to be able to attend this this morning with you all, and I'm... I'm Thank you, and good luck with your journey, and come tomorrow to your <laughs> our support group. That would be terrific. I'll put up, in fact, after we leave today, I'm going to put up the information for tomorrow's support group, and I hope to see you all there. Thank you, Sian. Thank you, Sue. Yes, we, you know, Jamie, we would also be willing at any point if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free if they connect through you, if that's the best way. Our website. You're, yeah, website. yeah, through our website. But we are, are more than willing to, to help in any way we can. And I have, like I said, I, I kind of have been on the, the, the other end for a long time, more on the treatment and, you know, things that can actually help you know, as um, the disease progresses too, I'd be glad to be able to, to be a resource for, for Thank you all. Thank you. I've got one other question. Uh, if you've got time, I was wondering about uh, organic foods as opposed to those that are sprayed. Have you studied that at all? Yeah. Oh, that's a hotbed, isn't it? Um, so I just was having a conversation this morning with a colleague. Um, so in the science, in the literature, there the difference between organic and inorganic foods um, is very vague, even though there's been a lot of hype around organic. We dietitians, us, we in general say, if you're worried about that, um, organic is going to be more expensive. So choose wisely. If you, if you want organic foods, then choose the types of organic foods that don't have covers, skins. Bananas, I go inorganic. Oranges, inorganic. Strawberries, maybe organic. Um, raspberries, maybe organic. Because, I mean, if, that, if and then there's the dirty dozen, and that's been controversial, yeah. what would you say? No, I mean, again, we, we really know that we need to get more vegetables and fruits into people. Okay, so um, if the way to do that, if there's a, a budgetary issue or whatever, we you know, we recognize that it would be best to get more vegetables and fruits, you know, into the consumer. So, um, it, but if, if you can afford to eat organic, and that's a choice that you have made, we, we believe that, you know, you're going to get less pesticide consumption and that kind of thing. But uh, again, the, the dirty dozen are the ones that are more known to have, you know, absorption of those chemicals and things into them. So for myself, I, I look at that list and I try to choose organic of those. Um, but again, being more mindful that we need it to increase overall quantity. So, and, and I have one last thing to say about that. Um, again, think about the organically grown product, produce and the inorganic. The one that has had to fight off things, has to fight off pesticides, has to fight off disease, will have more flavonoids in that outer right underneath the skin than perhaps the other one. And again, we need more food science research to, to validate that. But I think uh, that's another thing to be mindful of. Wonderful. Hey, one more question. Um, do you have a, that PDF of your last the, the, the brochure? If you could send that to me, I can send that to everybody and put it up on our site. Yeah, Thank sure. You. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Thank everybody you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Pleasure to be here Thank with you. you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.